Hey Squishies! Welcome back to another vlog. This is Star vs. the Forces of Evil, Season 2, Episode 2. And I've totally blanked on what the episode titles were. This is another really good pair, and again, uh, sharing themes between them. And in fact, themes that were related to the previous episode. Because both of these episodes are about anxieties about growing up, um, anxieties about who you are and who you're becoming. Um, the first segment focused mostly on Star, and her name's in the title after all. Uh, it was good. It's actually interesting because I say it focused mostly on Star, but actually I think Marco had more screen time in it, even though it was ultimately about Star. Uh, there's a lot that I really enjoyed in it. Uh, here's, I, I seem to be making these in a lot of videos lately. Here's another pro tip. Um, never challenge someone to ping pong that owns their own ping pong table. In fact, never challenge somebody to anything if they own their own equipment for it. Because odds are good that they will kick your ass. Um, you know, I noticed there's an arcade machine in Tom's room as well. Like, somebody owns an arcade machine for, you know, Street Fighter or whatever. Don't challenge them to it because they will destroy you. Uh, unless you're okay with getting your ass kicked, which, you know, sometimes a game is fun either way. But if you're trying to win, best not to play somebody who has it right there in their bedroom, implying that they do it a lot. Mm -hmm. Also, never challenge somebody to a contest who has, like, satanic powers, because that usually includes being really good at games and competitions. Just, you know, general advice. Um... I actually really like that the Guidance Counselor is in league with evil here because, I mean, in high school, uh, I got some good advice from my Guidance Counselor. Um, I think Guidance Counselors are good things to have. I think, you know, they can help kids a lot with difficult points in their lives. But there's one thing that Guidance Counselors get brought in for that I think is awful. And it's exactly what he was doing uh, in this episode, which was career. They call it career advice, but it's really like career imposition. You know, I think we start putting pressure on kids way too young to know what their career is going to be. You know, because I thought... What I thought I was going to be doing in high school when I grew up, what I thought in high school I was going to be doing when I grow up was completely different from what I ended up doing. Not even connected. And it really upset me when I realized that I did not have the skills. Um, I wanted to go into the sciences. It really, really upset me when I realized that I just could not do advanced math, which pretty much killed any hope of a scientific career. Uh, but in hindsight, man, did I dodge a bullet. Because actually doing the actual work of science would have been boring as hell for me. I'm not saying that science is boring. Science is actually really interesting to me. Uh, the it's the actual doing of it. It's, you know, the actual doing of the experiments that I realized I don't really enjoy that much. Uh, I prefer to work with words and with people. So, instead, I got a job where it's all about communicating with people uh, and writing. So, you know, my day job, I mean. Um, yeah. so, 
I really think we put too much pressure on kids too young to know what they're going to do when they grow up. Um, most people change careers several times in the course of their lives, and I think we should tell kids that. We shouldn't be telling them there is one true career that is the only one that is right for you and it should be possible to know what it is right now when your entire being is in flux. I think kids should use high school and if they go to college, the first couple of years of college uh, to explore, to try out different things, you know, make up, you know, if they have something they're pretty sure they want to do, let them do it. But let them and encourage them to try out different things, you know? Uh, my nephew is around the same age as the characters in this show. And he is really good at, you know, computer type stuff. Um, like really, really good. But he's also got a lot of musical talent and really good at, like, abstract design kind of art. And so I've tried to encourage him to do, you know, to play around with that as well and to try that. And, you know, if the opportunity shows up, to take classes in that even. Um, and because he might find out he likes that more, he might not. He might keep it as a hobby, or he might pursue it as a career, or he might do one and then 20 years down the line switch careers to the other. And especially as a teenager, you should be free to do that, you know? Free to experiment. So I hate those put everybody in line and make them take tests and then tell them, oh, you're going to be a janitor. And of course, that's what the episode was all about. It was about, you know, them saying to Star, you have to be queen. And Star being like, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to be stuffy and like my mom. But as they make the point at the end, she can be who she is. Um, she can become queen and define for herself what it is, just as anybody can grow up and define for themselves who they are. Of course, the flip side of that is that you have to define for yourself who you are, which is what Marco's dream in the next episode is about, is about his fears of who is he, is he going to figure out who he is, are his other friends leaving him behind as they figure out who they are and move on with their lives, and he's left kind of in limbo, unsure of what he wants to do or be. Um, I also now see why trans Marco is a thing. Um, there were some hints at the late last season that, you know, he enjoyed being a princess. But now, like, there were definitely some metaphors in that dream sequence that could be read uh, as him being uh, some... I'm going to go with him because he's still uh, presenting and identifying as a boy uh, at this point in the series. I don't know if that changes later. Um, but there's definitely some hints that he's at least, you know, that he's not possibly a cis man. Uh, he might be a trans woman, he might be some variety of non-binary or fluid or whatever. Um, that's part of why I'm sticking with the him right now, because that's the only uh, pronoun we've seen used in regards to him. Um, but who knows, you know, if it changes down the line, he decides he wants a different set. Awesome. Although I kind of suspect that's not going to happen on a Disney show. Um, Disney tends to be a little more conservative about that than the other networks. Um, like, I don't think Disney has had 
a main character in any of their shows who isn't, um, you know, Alice is set. Um, whereas, you know, Nickelodeon has had um, a bi main character in Korra, too, at least, actually. Um, and Cartoon Network has had uh, Steven Universe, which, you know, the majority of the cast well, I guess if you count Connie and Greg as main characters, half the cast are, you know, genderqueer, essentially. Um, they're aliens, obviously, so it's a little different. But, I mean, when Steven and Connie merge into Stevani, Stevani is non-binary. So that... There you go, right there. Um, I kind of lost the track of my thought. I was talking about Trans Marco. Um, we don't know. I don't know. Maybe all of you know. Maybe, you know, it's official. Something actually happened in the show. But even if it doesn't, I like that they are, at this point, I think, can say that they are actively trying to support that reading, which I guess you could read as a form of queer baiting, but I think in this case, it's not so much that as them trying to support viewers uh, for who want that representation without getting in trouble with the network censors. I think is, is more likely what's happening. Um, anyway, that aside, the episode is clearly about Marco's uncertainty because he doesn't have any idea where he's going with his life and he feels like he needs to. And part of that is that artificial pressure, I think, you know, that we saw in the previous episode. But I think also... Living in a state of flux is kind of nerve-wracking because you don't know where you're going. Um, and so I think finding a path that he can choose for himself, even if it's not the path that he's going to spend the rest of his life on, it's a path forward. It's some sense in which he is progressing toward a goal is really important for him. And so the great quest for his red belt. Mm. I'm kind of mm, on the show making fun of the uh, uh, teacher for living with his mom. Um, now, I don't live with my mom because, uh, well, A, I don't need to, and B, I don't want to. Um... Mom is a lovely woman, and I love her very much, and I never, ever want to live in the same house as her. Um, so I haven't since 2006, I think? 2005 or 2006. Um, but that's because I got lucky. I graduated college in 2005, before the economy went into the crapper. So I was able to find decent work and a career and advance in that and, you know, make a reasonable amount of money and be able to afford to live on my own. A lot of people in, who, who are now, like, you know, people who are five years younger than me are still in their 30s. Um, and you graduated college in 2010? Man, you are screwed. And frankly, it's a historical aberration. This idea that you grow up, move out of your parents' house, and live on your own. 
that's not how people lived for most of human history. That is an invention of the 1950s. Mm. Prior to that, people generally uh, grew up, got married, moved into their parents' house, except they didn't move. Uh, one of the married partners, usually the woman, would move into the other person's house they shared with their parents and siblings and whoever else. And then inherit the house when your parents die. Uh, you would have multiple generations living in the same house. Um, sometimes crammed in very tightly because, you know, poor people have been around forever. Um, and frankly, single family dwellings as we think of them, with their own little patches of land, are kind of also an invention of the 50s. Uh, so yeah, that's, there shouldn't be shame in that, and it's kind of classist to shame people for something that they very likely had no control over. I mean, the guy who runs the dojo has a job. You know, he's doing everything right. He just isn't lucky enough to be making enough to move out on his own. It happens. Um, I can't tell you how many people I know who weren't as lucky as me and do have to live with their parents or who get laid off and have to move back in with their parents. It happens. It's the way things work now. And it's the way things work for most of human history, like I said. Uh, so that kind of irked me. But at the same time, it's a way of showing that this is a man who gives up a little too easily and never found his way in life or did and gave up on it. Whereas Marco is incredibly determined. Marco pushes through. Marco... You know, actually kind of just like with um, Tom. He challenged someone to a battle that he should not have been able to win. And against Tom, he won by persevering through 58 games until he finally persuaded Tom that, you know, this wasn't the right way. He lost every single individual game, but he won in the sense of persuading Tom uh, to do what he wanted to do. Um... And he won for real against the uh, tape store owner, which uh, I really enjoyed him. Uh, that was a funny character. be cool if he comes back in some way, but I don't know how. And I don't know if he'd be as funny without the surprise of, oh my god, he's actually, you know, just hunched down really low. He's actually enormous and super buff. Um, I also liked the hypocrisy of him wanting... Uh, Marco to wear gloves before he could handle a tape, but he was willing to destroy half his inventory in the fight with Marco. Mm. Just a fun character. Uh, and yeah, Marco's a red belt now. He progressed towards something. He achieved something. Good for him. Um, it'll be interesting to see, like, if this anxiety persists, though, and if so, what form it takes. Like, I have a feeling that uh, this conflict that was set up in the first episode with Star, that she doesn't want to be the same kind of queen as her mom, which is honestly kind of a continuation of the St. Olga thread. She doesn't want to be the kind of princess that becomes a queen like her mom. Uh, I have a feeling that'll be back, that thread. And I wonder if the thread of Marco not being quite certain where he's headed, you know, the exact opposite problem, uh, will come up again. Either way, I've now been talking about this episode almost, almost as long as the length of the episode, so I'm going to call it here. I'll see you all next time. Bye! Bye.